Okay, somebody is. Uh, so, for such an intimate uh, gathering, which I appreciate. Uh, just a few words uh, before we begin, and I think that everyone knows everyone, so I'm not going to spend time on uh, introducing more than names, but I just pulled together some notes this morning because I was so loving how yesterday's festival themes seem to intersect and permeate the themes of this panel, at least. Uh, and it was so interesting when uh, Meta yesterday brought up to the first panel the issue of permission. And I felt like that was one of the themes, the way everyone answered it, that really permeates everything we do, not only in terms of dance, but in terms of society we're moving back and forth. And I kind of listed various uh, things that people on that panel had said, including uh, Kevin here. Uh, it, there seemed to be communal permission, ancestral, internal or self-permission, cultural, um, respectful, uh, spiritual. And uh, it seemed to me that this all was kind of floating around in all that we are here for, in a sense. Uh, your paper, Anirka's, uh, which is, and your performance last night, which was site-specific and kind of injected into the premise of permission, not asking permission, no se pide, uh, uh, which kind of, sort of, implies also an internal uh, or self permission as well. And uh, that then also uh, resonates with uh, Yinka's theme in clay uh, of going beyond the mulatto stereotype and going in and further. And also that Zen thing that says the only way out is through. Uh, Reclaiming my time, and everybody I'm sure remembers Maxine Waters. Reclaiming my time. And um, Jay, Jay Loomis seems to be reclaiming through this work an invisibilized identity, uh, which again is part of uh, something interesting that you said, Kevin uh, Lamar Jones. Uh, you said you would say, dance reunion rather than dance fusion. And um, in some cases, and I wanted to read a little book, a tiny drop from my first book, not a lot at all, but because it fits in, uh, uh, that this, uh, it, in terms of dance reunion rather than dance fusion, uh, in cases of having to dig for the Africanist presence, and in this case in flamenco, uh, I call it definitely dance reclamation. Uh, what I wanted to mention though, we, we're talking a lot about enslaved Africans in uh, Spain uh, through this incredible film, but just to mention that Africanist, and I'm quoting myself, mm -hmm. Africanist influences have laced through European culture for centuries in 13th century Spain, and I believe that is before the, the slave trade, at a time when the na that nation was an ascendant European power, illuminated manuscripts show African and European musicians playing side by side. Spanish culture was a rich landscape of Jewish, African, and Latin strains. Songs, and this goes earlier than the, the 15th century songs in Burumbe, songs by the 13th century Spanish king Alfonso, such as his Cantitas de Maria, were accompanied by Africanist rhythms played on the dumbek, an African drum from Islamic cultures. And again, the whole Islamic sense of the cantaur is uh, very much implied there. Um, and again, the whole thing about Moorish, you know, that's really a euphemism for African. So all of these things at play that we are complexifying and um, going through and beyond at this point, I think. Uh, 
and then Yesenia's theme of Kuros, which uh, we talked I talked about a little bit with Raul uh, last night. Uh, <clears throat> that that and, and how that played in the film when uh, uh, Raul was singing. And this idea of, you know, they were uh, the freed population who again brought all of these riches and again had been invisibilized. So all of these kind of things, which I think are playing out in the work that we're seeing and that I'm really looking forward to and hearing with our um, pres presenters today. It's 226. I'm going to give each of you, like, we can leave if we want. And uh, just so that there's some time for talking afterwards. Uh, about 20, 20 minutes for presenting. Okay, um, so this is my first time presenting on this topic. Um, uh, this is a kind of a surprising turn uh, into uh, my research on aesthetics that just started this over the summer. Um, so, burros, uh, rumberos, and cubanos, y cubanos. Uh, since the beginning of the Spanish conquest, Cuban chronistas and historians describe the presence of the, of the, of the uh, uh, black curros. Africans coming from the Spanish peninsula who were accustomed to the Gypsy and Andalusian traditions. Although there is, they were in big numbers during the first centuries of colonial Cuba, they left an imprint in Cuban popular culture. Uh, most scholars look at uh, the curro traces as extinct uh, and in the past. Uh, but I propose in this paper rather, rather a cross-pollinization cross of the curros into several dimensions of, dimensions of Cubanness. I propose uh, curros as uh, in, the, in the spaces of diasporic intimacies they create with other Afro-Cuban ethnicities as uh, an underground railroad bringing the Spanish popular culture into the new world. Mm -hmm. A main informant of this piece is my praxis as a dancer, but more importantly as a teacher of Afro-Cuban dance for about two decades. To learn to dance Cuban rumba, uh, to teach, I always have to talk about the curros and explain why the flamenco movements shows up unexpectedly in in rumba repertoire. But dancing and teaching was only the beginning uh, to keep reading against the grain, ethics and aesthetics entangled to Cuban national construction. So let's start for what <clears throat> most people know and uh, certainly it's the work of uh, Victor Patricio Landaluce uh, presenting like the types of, of Cuban, um, Cuban social caste, no? Um, and this is uh, one of, of the main images, and I put together some um, literary references. Uh, the first one is uh, from Cecilia Valdez, uh, our you know, foundational uh, novel and text. Um, that, that in that Cirilo Villaverde they discuss or present uh, the curro. It is the curro, or your mulatto from the Mangrel neighborhood, a killer, stubborn, unemployed, rather by habit, thief by profession, the one that is raised in the streets, that leaves off the rap raping and, the, and, and that since its birth is this time to the feather or, or a violent death. And um, another, um, this is more um, a journalist, um, uh, Jose Victoriano Betancourt, also discussed the curros as uh, having a physiognomy uh, that, well, that was scary, you know, as a scary, uh, like kind of the dangerous type, the dangerous uh, blackness, you know? Um, <clears throat> And he talked about the mancaperros, you know, that I'm glad that I have my mancaperros <laughs> to represent <laughs> uh, the curridad in Cuban culture, uh, and how they caught their teeth. I think, uh, like in these images of, of the past, uh, there was a, a strong impression of the aesthetics of the curro, the way that they presented itself, the performativity of, uh, of, of curro image, you no? Know? 
like with the with the bell uh, pans or the estolas, the mantillas, uh, etc. No. Um, A little bit, but I um, looking back to, to Rumba, that is kind of my real, no? I uh, discovered, I realized that there are many songs, uh, Rumba songs, that kind of uh, recover or preserve uh, the memory of, of curros in Cuban culture. And this is uh, one case that is uh, talking about the motherland, motherland, I will never forget you. I always will remember, remember, rem I always remember, remember, remember you. I am from Santander, no? Curro I am, curro I am, I will never deny it. When I came from my uh, uh, motherland, I brought uh, a, a song from my land that says like this. But the song is an African song. It's not, uh, the song that is uh, this coro at the end, no? Mm -hmm. It's not an Africa. It's not an Spanish song, no. So this is a very uh, interesting turn you know, uh, inside the song, you know, toward recovering the Africanness of the curro too, you know. Um, so um, I struggle a lot to find um, rumba images or rumba videos, and that I could see directly like the flamenco movements. Uh, but it's, it's, it's uh, for me, it was, it's a trouble, <laughs> struggle uh, with, with the research because um, when I was uh, studying uh, rumba in Cuba like three decades ago, uh, there were like less uh, groups and spaces in that rumba could be, could be seen could, or, or was performed, barely like Conjunto Fakurico Nacional. Muñequitos de Matanza, there were like three, four uh, uh, ensembles that actually performed the rumba. And, uh, and rumba was slower than it is today. <laughs> uh, rumba was, uh, was more poetic, I would say, that, that it is today. But as uh, Cuban society has changed, rumba has changed as well. But I could at least um, found this, um, these images of Madeleine Rodriguez and Ismaray, and to me it's, it's interesting, like are the rumberas, you know, the women that dance the rumba, or that are teaching rumba today, the ones that are claiming a kind of this flamenco repertoire inside the rumba. Um, but it was not like that in the past. No? In the past I used to, I remember um, way more um, male performers. Yes that enter and use like the flamenco movements, no? Um, okay, here's, um, here's another picture of, of Madeleine. Uh, and just writing a little bit about, about trying to unravel like the rumba repertoires and the technical aspects of the rumba, no? I was, um, I was considering, you know, what the rumbera, what how the what what the rumbera does, you know, also is in conversation with la maja, no, or the flam of the flamenco uh, dancer, no. I would say like the underlying this the core of the rumbera dance is defined more for African uh, principles, like the um, I, I use this uh, Yoruba concept, the iwon iwon tun won si. That is very. It's more. It's, it, it kind of invites the dancers to move less, no? But it's uh, the less motion or less openness is also an indication in Yoruba culture of uh, of divine connection, mm -hmm. right? So the best dancer in the Yoruba culture is not the one that do more, but the one that do less, mm -hmm. no? Uh, because um, I don't know that their, their aesthetics and philosophy tend to this um, uh, to the to I don't know celebrates uh, balance you no know, and grace you no know? uh, but uh, anyhow uh, the rumberas uh, the rumberas um, historically have a lot of elements also from the flamenco movements like the mantillas and the skirts and the grace with the they perform uh, the rumba, the sensuality, 
you know, like the, the provocation, but at the same time, and a strength and sense of, of protection, no? mm -hmm. that, that, that like they are in control. No? So these, these are uh, tensions that are underlying technically in uh, how the rumba dance is performed by women. Um, but thinking again about uh, those, um, I don't know, diasporic intimacies, no? and, and how they are um, supported by, by concepts um, deeply tied to the, to the, to the aesthetics, uh, I, I have to go back to Lorca and play in the, in theory of the duende. No, uh, and how this could be like a sort of a mirror concept to the concept of evil, you know, that is uh, fundamental in the context of uh, Cuban rumba. No, um, so but they are uh, they are kind of grasping or, or trying to define this connection with the intangible, you no, know, with the intangible, with something that is beyond Earth. No? or beyond the personhood, no? Like in the moment of the performance, there is something, this is X factor, you know, that have to come out to create like the spark uh, in the stage. Um, but to Lorca, uh, he has like this conversation between the duende and the angel that I think is very productive, you know? When the muse sees death appear, she closed the door. When the angel sees death appear, he flies in slow circles. The duende, by contrast, won't appear. He can see the possibility of death. With idea, sound, gesture, the duende delights in struggling freely with the creator on the edge of the key. Angel and muse flee, and the duende wounds. And in trying to heal that wound that never heals, lies the strangeness, the inventiveness of a man work. But I would say like the idioma in the context of Cuban culture, and I am um, quoting here Ivan Miller, um, that he's an expert in the Abaqua and, and, and Calabari uh, preaches into Cuban culture, um, because idioma is a Calabari word. Uh, so it came uh, in, into Cuban culture through the Abaqua uh, uh, tradition, no? <coughs> So Iviono means good intonation in music. The term Iviono may be rhythm or voice that comes from the sea. In Efik and Ivivio, Iviono means a barrier. The word Iviono means become constructed in the way. You know? so, so I think in, in this definition, there is this idea of the Iviono is something that you have to be a connoisseur you know, to express. It's not something that is in the reach or the access of everybody. It's something that you have to go beyond the bridge, you know, beyond the barrier to finally understand or express through your body and through your performance as a dancer or a musician. Um, but a couple of years ago, and just I was kind of, um, interviewing different people, I, I summarize it in a, in a different way, you no know? more, less into the Calabari or the Abacua, but more broadly, you know, uh, how the old school rumberos define Ivy, you know, as the divine grace, the distinctive quality of ritual dancers and musicians that make the performance captivate. Um, so I want to speed up to um, an interesting finding in this sort of archaeology of the curro uh, that is not only inside the rumba but but toward the aesthetic of Cuban culture no and the first one is certainly through what we understand or is presented as the rumba outfit no mm -hmm. and uh, in this uh, picture we we have uh, Lilon and Paulito uh, that were um, important international rumberos in the, in the 30s and the 40s. And uh, we can see like the, the rough falls and kind of, you know, elements that go into Cuban culture through the curro aesthetic, but are preserved into rumba and in particular in those moments of great spectacularization um, as was the rumba craze after 1927. And even more 
interesting <laughs> is like uh, this is at the base of um, what we understood as the Cuban national costume too. Uh, so the bata cubana, the Cuban bata, is like uh, what is transnationally understood like the Cuban costume, no? like the Cuban national costume. No? Um, and uh, there is a, a lot of debate, uh, interesting, about, about what is the national costume. No? So some people talk about the guayabera, but the guayabera is certainly a masculine, but guayabera is a, is a church. No? Uh, a linen shirt, no? Uh, but it's, it's a masculine piece. Uh, in the Guayabera, we don't see that much uh, this connection to the Spanish popular culture, but in the, in the women uh, dresses, there's still a lot of echoes of uh, the flamenco, the flamenco outfit, no? Uh, Five minutes. Sorry, what? Five minutes. Okay. And well, I have to bring also Celia Cruz. Uh, that, uh, I don't know, I think Celia Cruz in the Bata Cubana, there is a lot, a lot of pictures of, of Celia actually using like Cuban national uh, costume. And uh, I don't know, I, I think um, looking back uh, at, at what the curros brought in, into, into Cuba, um, beyond these uh, aesthetic markers, no, I also think it's important this attitude, no, more in terms of an ethic, no, uh, that they import, no, like this defiant and hearty attitude, which was always or bring a different system of values for the Cuban underclasses, no. It was easy for them, the curros, to evoke a certain combativeness and romantic code that was fed by the consciousness as gypsies, blacks, or second class citizens. They use. Um, and they embodied it. They perf a performing and playful sensuality and a defiant attitude that stay inscribed in the masculinity codes of Cuban rumba, particular, particularly those of the Columbia. In flamenco, set in the entrance to a tablado, is marked by men with high rising chest that invocates a divine protection of real, uh, from, from real or spiritual harms. With the curroness, no? there is a fearless entrance into the battle. Men and bulls are defeated. Curreria, therefore, guarantees the submission of the rivals, the victory at all costs. To be a curro is to be a man without fear, affirming freedom for black bodies, slaves, maroons, Africans, Spain, Spanish, and Cubans. Yes. I, I think I have a minute, and yes, you do. I want to... You do? Um, I couldn't, like... Is this, is this on? No, this is not on. The one, the one next to that thing is. No, it's not See? No. No. Yeah, I wanted to show some of the El Currito. Is it? No, no, no. I would never deny it, that's what's missing in the <laughs> Oh, 
Arambele kumbele. Aha. Arambele kumbele. So now, thank you. Well, thank you very much. That, <clears throat> there's so many connections. So I'm gonna try not to let my brain do the thing it does, which is try to make, try to explain them all or highlight them all for the sake of time. Uh, and try to stick to our agenda, which is a difficult thing for me. Um, before I do that, I wanna just acknowledge, I wanna thank you for being here. I wanna thank everyone who's here, both physically and not. Um, mm -hmm. It is part of my personal tradition and it's important for me to start there. Thank you. Um, this is uh, what I'm going to present to you today is the result or one more stepping stone in a very long process of self-reflection and of working with in the materiality of flamenco, but also of my own being and becoming. Um, so they're not solid answers, just more questions. I'm going to start with um, a quote by Diana Taylor from her book on performance in Latin America. And it's this, we learn and transmit knowledge through embodied action, through cultural agency and by making choices. Performance for me functions as an episteme, a way of knowing, not simply an object of analysis. If performance did not transmit knowledge, only the literate and powerful could claim social memory and identity. I was recently invited to present a paper at the 20th Annual Ifeile Afro-Cuban Dance Festival and Conference in a gathering entitled Dancing Cubanness, Issues of Identity and Globalization. On the surface, the title seems to encompass a clear and succinct topic. On the surface, it asks that we look at how the space of Cubanness is performed, where agency enters and how we move it forward. But what does Cubanness even mean? Which elements of our culture do we choose to dance? Which remain regulated to spaces of cultural tradition and history, believed by some to be apt only as museum pieces? This bit alone is enough for a dissertation, but for now and for our purposes here, I've chosen to bypass the complexity of my own identity, recognizing it as one that exists in a liminal space that although very real to me, finds contention in the established norms of what it means to be Cuban. I've chosen instead to focus on how this Cubanness manifests. My Cubanness acts on my flamenco. What it has taught me and how it continues to shift and morph my compositional practice. And this is just some of the questions that I ask as I go along. So the auto-ethnographic choreography, is this really what I do? I'm not even sure myself. But what I do know is that for quite some time now, I've been working with ideas about decolonization my own decolonization specifically in the performance space. Issues of representation of the female body and the othering of said body have been central. Recently, however, it's become clear that the conversation is actually much more layered. As I've come to understand my hybrid self as a constant negotiation between multiple lines of tension. I navigate these lines now, but there was a time when they pulled with very little space for agency. Some time ago, while creating the first stages of the material that would lead to Siempre Quise Ser Bailadora, a recent work that explores the deconstructing of the flamenco performance space and the decolonizing of the Indonesia body, there was a moment when I realized that I was beginning to dig further than I had intended. And this is always problematic. And this is just some notes from my own practice journals. All practice rehearsals must take place in the space it will be performed. I choose a basement level black box. There's something hidden womb-like about it, and it seems to go hand in hand with the ideas I'm seeking to enlighten. It must be clarified that the work with Damaris has been going on for a number of years now, and it is woven into my very personal map. I need only to look at Hefner Hayes Flamenco, Michelle Hefner Hayes book Flamenco, to see evidence of it. The book contains various images gathered over the years of our work with the company. In this time, we have made choices to strengthen or oppose stereotypes, as we've always understood that we're active agents in this process. As Hefner Hayes explains, the conflicting narratives of flamenco's history reflect the struggle for power among differently aligned participants in a global culture. Although the flamenco stereotype retains enough consistent qualities to be intelligible, its overall characteristics shift according to the specific context. Correspondingly, the historical narratives that shape stereotypes contract and expand to fall out of order 
and develop blackout spells to accommodate disruptions in the distribution of power. And I think we only need to look back not too far into Flamenco's history to realize how true that can be. Now, if one of the things that came up consistently for me, particularly as I was doing the MFA and I was in this space of the academy and what the academy expected of me and what the academy thought was admissible for me to explore. And that struggle, and anyone who wants to dig into this, look up Juno Diaz's um, article on MFA versus POC. Very enlightening <laughs> to this topic. And one of the things I came upon as I was doing this, I, I, I struggled with the methodologies and with everything that was going around and all this headspace. And it was just, I, we kept entering the space of body in crisis. Body in crisis, we'd tell each other. And we'd literally like drop our books and go get salsa dancing. It was like, we, we just have to, we have to go back to something that's real because this is just a little too much. So in that space, in, 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 in one of, I think it was actually in one of those clubs, we looked at each other and we went, collage, that's it. That's what we are. This is what makes sense. So if we consider collage and cascachismo as an approach to composition in flamenco, are we not speaking of such disruptions? And in seeking an integrated mode of inquiry for flamenco that was aligned with phenomenological descriptions, a choreographic process that's developed specifically for the work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, fill in all the blanks, it became evident that we need a methodology capable of accommodating that multiplicity that already existed multiplicity of discourses, of cultural elements, of the lived body. After much consideration, Collage emerged as a potentially rich site for exploring this. And I go, and I go into Amy Kilgard's work on Collage because she sort of condenses it. You know, Collage, just like flamenco, has gone through periods of expanding and collapsing and expanding and collapsing. But this is what I found to be interesting for the kind of questions I was asking. So she posits four facets of collage as paradigmatic for performance studies, or for performance. One, collage involves examining at least the double life of its constitutive uh, components. Two, collage is a sensual, sensual sensory embodied practice. Collage involves juxtaposition and relationships of elements in time and space, and it's unsettled. And that last piece to me was the most important. In essence, through its own inherent multiplicity, collage opens a space for plotting elements in such a way that they're allowed to comment on each other, while eliminating the necessity for a homogeneous interpretation. So this became the basis for the work that was happening. And then some of the questions that came up. Would stereotypes, which in this case we can understand for oversimplified or exaggerated strands of the form, and I'm speaking of flamenco here, distorted códigos, not provide fertile ground on which to explore some of these shifts and distributions of power. We already understand these images as commodity, as many flamenco scholars, including Hagner Hayes, have pointed out. We understand it because we too have utilized them when necessary to forward agendas, whether in an attempt to clarify what flamenco is or is not. In this case, the intention is to enter a space where the tensions are allowed to play themselves out. What I've come to understand in, in this process of utilizing collage and looking specifically at decolonization, deconstruction, all of the D prefixes, I realized that I had to look at what was accepted and normalized and realized that it was multifaceted and multilayered. I've also come to understand that it can only be affected if the decolonizing of the human body also includes the decolonizing of its language, both movement and rhythm. As Kenyan author, Ngugi Wa Thiongo, author of Decolonizing the Mind, illustrates when he examines how the mental space of colonized peoples came to be invaded and appropriated. He states, the most important area of domination was the mental universe, the control through culture of how people perceive themselves and their relationship to the world. The language of power is English, and that becomes internalized. You normalize the abnormal and the absurdities of a colonialism and turn them into a norm from which you operate. Then you don't even think about it. I do not want a colonized body. This phrase said to me by a fellow dancer of similar background in questioning was the first step to reconsidering the space of experimentation and finding self within flamenco. One would think that I make the correlation directly referencing the Spanish colonization, on the surface at least, the language being flamenco and that which has internalized its form. But I'm actually drawn to the idea driven not by the Spanish elements of my periodics, but instead by the normalizing within the academy of Eurocentric contemporary canons. For this is the language of power, and this is what becomes internalized. Within contemporary and experimental flamenco, 
it is the use almost exclusively of Western Eurocentric contemporary dance, theater, and visual arts practices that is the abnormal that has been normalized. The ideas about what is standardized and normalizing and accepted. In me, granted, it's the somatic and contemporary dance training received all in the US and in the university, the compositional tools gained while working with choreographers like Liz Lerman and Wally Cardona, the numerous exchanges with Western visual and performing artists, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in me, what is normalized as acceptable is also an unrelenting curiosity of how ritual steeps into composition. It is my Afro-Cuban dance and music training, my own spiritual practice, the understandings I have come to as a result of my own personal history and community, but also that of my culture. The integrations granted of works by Walter Benjamin, Lefebvre, my own resistance to Foucault, but it's also the works of Gloria Salua, Fernando Ortiz, Lidia Cabrera, and as Yesenia just reminded me, Cirilo Villaverde and our infamous Cecilia Valdez that we all carry in our backpacks. The body is political. It acts upon a complex system of affairs and states that must be negotiated, and how it does so is dependent on its prehensions. In other words, what if we position ourselves in the in-between spaces, in the hyphens of our hybrid, hybrid identities, and create work that calls into question our understanding of hybridity and by extension the artistic dialogue that can emerge from said space. ¿Qué tal si nos posicionamos? In flamenco, the basis of most of my choreography is the acceptable and normalized form. So if it is the acceptable and normalized that we question, then this is where mine must begin. And as mentioned earlier, it's not through, my, through the insertion of yet another normalized can, but through the insertion of my own personal <coughs> habitus and expression. At first glance, and this is a direct reference, I'm so glad that Yesenia went first because there's so many intersections with this, this topic that it was like the perfect foundation. I was like, yes, this is good. At first glance, within flamenco circles in Spain, this would seem manageable at least. And there, I see various faces in the room of those who have had experiences living this habit. One finds a strange mixture of nostalgia or Cuba, evidenced by phrases like Mase Perdi en Cuba but also a fascination or resonance with the contemporary Cuban music and rhythms. I say resonance because I will, I'll pull on this thread later in the historical ties. This mixture posits a Cuban dancer <coughs> in a space of some privilege within flamenco. And I know both Yinka and Nelly are shaking their heads because they perfectly understand what the kind of space that I'm talking about. Where as a foreigner, there is a definite gauge. It's almost, it's almost like a barometer of how close can you get to the thing that looks like the flamenco body, and then we'll, we'll position you, depending on that. And it's very real, it's a very real lived experience. This mixture posits a Cuban dancer in the space of some privilege. You're still an outsider of Ortega, mm -hmm. but there's some level of acceptance because you're from that exotic place that is lost and forever frozen in memory, while simultaneously the home of Che and in the post-Franco mentality, a place to be admired for its resistencia. And ultimately, you also come from a rooted form. Some time ago, um, but again, I ask, what is Cuban? Who is Cuban? How do we navigate these waters? What defines cultural identity and habitus? Who gets to determine it? These are the questions that fly around on a regular basis. Some time ago, I had the pleasure of spending time with non-disciplinary art scholar Mayra More Morales. Morales is equal parts traditional scholar, readily quoted in Whitehead, and Mexican chamana. And during our exchange in the middle of this crisis of, oh my God, I'm just trying to present my thesis proposal and we can't get past the first two sentences because there's, there's no willingness to go deep. Maida uh, shared a story of as a young child, her father was a diplomat in Mexico and one day coming home from school and one of the kids having said to her in a very derogatory manner, tu padre es indio, your dad's indian. Referring in a very uh, disrespectful matter to the indigenous populations of that area. And he didn't ask you a question. He said, Mi conmigo, grabbed her hand, took her to the market, walked her through the market. And anybody who's ever been in the market in Mexico, it's, it's a, a hodgepodge of cultures and people and all sorts of things happening. And they came upon this one woman selling her wares of one particular indigenous group. And the father turned to her and said, am I Indian? And she looked around, she must have been eight, 10 years old, and said, I'm not sure, but you're not this. And so it was his way of saying to her, look around, see what, what, what gets taken in. And his response to her was, and I'll say it for Spanish, and I'll translate. Yo no necesito que tú me veas 
como yo me veo. Necesito que me veas como tú necesitas verme. I don't need you to see me how I see myself. I need you to see me how you need to see me. Does this mean agency over self-identification is lost or abandoned or handed over? Not in the least bit. It simply means that I recognize your need to categorize and choose not to be defined by it. But I must recognize it, become aware of that categorization before we can move forward. I had the, um, for five years almost, I worked with Juan Carlos Lerida. Juan Carlos Lerida is, is a Spanish choreographer um, who has been a, a, one of the main voices in Flamenco Pirico and in the, this whole space of contemporary and experimental flamenco. And we worked hand in hand for quite a while. About a year ago, we were creating a piece, a solo performance, where it was his concept, his framework, and my story. And through that process, I realized how much, even with this person that I had already been five years in a mentorship relationship with, how much of what was okay as contemporary and experimental flamenco, how much of how that story was expressed, or what were the codifications that I used were dependent on, they fit, where they aligned with Merce Cunningham's thoughts on randomness, the music of John Cage or Steve Ray, uh, minimalism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in I come with my stories that have absolutely no connection to any of this. Um, and so it was a very problematic space. We handled it, but it was problematic. And one of the most interesting things that happened was he said to me, in a moment of frustration, he said, tell me which is the quintessential cobla for all humans. And I just sat down and I went, I penita pena. Like it was just a no-brainer. There's even, you know, La Profecia de Amanda. There's, there's all of these references to Lola Flores and I penita pena in Cuban, popular Cuban culture. And he looked at me and said, that's impossible because that, you know, there's so many that are more popular than that. And like, he really couldn't understand it. So fast forward two, three days later, um, we're at his partner's house and Manolo's just made coffee, a dear friend of mine, also Cuban. And he says, Manolo, what's the quintessential Cuban, for, you know, the copla for the Cubans to identify with Spanish culture? And Manolo says to him, and I brought it with me because it was just priceless. He says, wait, no te lo digo, te lo enseño. Grab the chair. En el firmamento, and went on and on and on to sing, I believe that thing. <laughs> Six foot four Cuban man, okay, suddenly like turned into Cecilia Valdez. It was priceless. And so what it, what it, what it taught me in that moment, it was like, a, like hitting a wall head first, saying, oh, okay, there are more questions here than I actually thought. Then there's a layer of the evident cross-pollination between Cuba and the south of Spain. The famous Leta del Tanguillo is the clearest example. La Habana Cali con Manerito, Cali La Habana con Masalero. It's the one that's constantly referenced over and over. But what, must we remain stuck in time, able to only represent elements of our culture within our other frameworks, i.e. the readily recognizable fusion, or is it possible to also work within contemporary frameworks by transposing our cultural elements onto these? I believe it is. And it is that space for this, and sorry, I believe it is, and that a space for this practice is not only possible, but also necessary. Two minutes. Mm -hmm. And I'm wrap it up. Good. <laughs> so, in other words, what if we position ourselves in the in-between spaces, the hyphens of our hybrid identities, and create work that calls into question our understanding of hybridity, and by extension, the artistic dialogue that can emerge from said space? Que tal si nos posicionamos? In a recent conversation with fellow artist Paola Escobar, she was telling me the story about applying to RedCat to a residency, RedCat here in San Francisco. Somebody was supporting her in this process, was also part of the panel. She was not chosen for the residency. And in a frustration of trying to explain to her why she wasn't chosen, the person said to her, es que tu trabajo no parece el trabajo de una mujer de color. Oh. The problem is your work doesn't look like the work of a woman of color. And her response to me was, it's a common shared conversation. It's a, that's okay, that's okay. <laughs> common conversation in this. She said, and once again, nuestro trabajo invisible. And once again, our work is invisible. Mm -hmm. And I will leave it with that. Like I said, I was just going to leave more questions, not any answers. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Well, we have about 15.
15 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. How do you want us to do this? You want us to sit back up here? Or I think we could. Okay. Yeah. And you know, the first thing I would like to do, even though there's not that much time, is to uh, <laughs> first see Jay, Yusenia, and Nika uh, if uh, you have any comments about each other's presentations. Ah. Okay. You're done. <laughs> uh, I I have um, a, a question for, for you, Jane, uh, because I, I was kind of surprised uh, to see a, a vacuum about Cuba in the conversation ah, of yeah. Atlantic Cajon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One and second, um, also because also in your linguistic exploration, also evade like uh, like the Angoma drums, for example, mm -hmm. that are, are Cuban too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, y right. what's going on with uh, that? What <laughs> 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 uh, It's not an intentional erasure, that's for sure. <laughs> but um, I did have more slides with pictures that okay. involved, that had Cajon is also from Cuba, I think in Puerto Rico, there's also in Colombia, mm -hmm. in Cajon Marimbulas, specifically, which also has the, it's not just the Cajon, but it also has these, um, I don't even know how to point them, these strips of, of metal that yeah. you can play, mm -hmm. kind of like the marimba, mm -hmm. from, from uh, Coma, marimba is from, where is marimba from? Marimba, Zimbabwe? I think. Several places in West yeah, Africa. In West, yeah. Okay, so yeah, it was just I, I ran out of time. Okay. Really. And I'm sorry about that. I knew it was I knew it was important. I knew that that the the culture of the cajon actually, Guillermo makes those cajones from Cuba. Uh -huh. So you know, I was all summer. I was kind of playing around. They look like uh, inverted obelisks almost mm -hmm. made out of wood. So it's got a big and then top but it's all all wood they're all boxes so um yeah thanks for pointing that out no 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 and, and, and also like it. like through your presentation i was yeah. uh, also thinking um i haven't seen uh, actually written any work on cuba marimba mm -hmm. but um just it happened that i come from a rural area okay and uh in in i remember like like my grandfather that i think is somebody that never claims to be a musician or anything but he he, he has a marimba and he sit down and play the marimba every afternoon. Mm -hmm. So it seems kind of a tradition that, you know, it, it was isolated. And, and I think like most uh, ethnographers and researchers work about uh, Cuban urban population and groups and traditions. Uh, but uh, certainly there is a lot of, a lot of other stories that can be told by like looking at other spaces as well. That was actually my question as well, for the same reason, because it seems like the, the, the rural traditions are just not documented enough <laughs> and that there's so many more links there. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if we look at, you know, settlement patterns and we look at, you know, where people move around and where they intersected I and mean, the urban, the, you know, the, the, the urban is always the place that we go to because we assume that that's where you know, the most mixing happened. But in Cuba well, in particular, but, but there's... I, I think it's, it's connected to yeah. your own concept yeah. of colonization, exactly. too, mm -hmm. no? I think, mm -hmm. uh, uh, for example, a, a city like Havana, the, there was a lot of, uh, you know, there is a lot of archive that has been produced about mm -hmm. that. So, uh, of course, uh, I don't ask every researcher to be an archaeologist, as I like yeah. call myself, no? Yeah. Like grasping, you know? kind of the places in that there are no sources, but if you follow the sources, these are the sources that you're going to find. Right, right. Um, exactly. Anyone else from? I did. I also yeah. had a question yeah, okay. for you. Uh, you're talking about uh, the need, you understand the need for someone else to see you as they need to see you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm always, especially Lately, I think right now in America, we feel a lot of divisions. I do at least, and with my family, friends, I, people across the spectrum. And, and I'm, one problem that I recognize with people who I tend to be more 
on the left and progressive like I am is it's easy for us to dismiss people like my parents, for example, and just be like, you're sorry, we can't converse. But I was wondering maybe, do you think that phrase that you mentioned could somehow alleviate some of that divisiveness? I'll tell you how it's, how it, what it's alleviated for me. I'm evidently white passing, and it's very difficult for me to be in certain spaces because there is a negation of parts of me when I enter those spaces. And it's always been very problematic for me. And it's in that space of coming to understand that, or rather, let me put it this way, in fighting that for years and years and years and years and getting to the place of being physically, mentally, emotionally exhausted by it. When I heard her in that moment say that to me, I thought, whoa, like my, my mind just exploded. I went, okay, this is a place to start from. Because if I'm able to hear where you're seeing me from and start to begin to get a sense of where, how you see me, then I can get a sense of where does this conversation even need to begin? You know, my, my insistence for so long was about saying, this is who I am, this is who I am, this is who I am, this is who I am. And that not being seen or simply, you know, I was having a conversation with the artist who worked with me on this piece last night. And he said, you know, the problem with me in the academy is that when I draw a circle, I'm not just drawing a circle. There's a Hoya, there's a cipher. And the problem with the faculty is they're looking at a circle. And when I tell them there's a Hoya or a cipher, they don't believe me. So that's, you know, all of these conversations intersect for me. It's, I can only fight that so far because it's the information that's coming at you. So, okay, tell me where you stand tell me where you see me, and then I can decide, do I want to even enter that space with you? Because I may not want to. I may say, okay, that's all good. See you on the next route, mm -hmm. you know? Or I may say, okay, now I get a better sense of where you're at, and we can begin to converse. So yeah, I think it does alleviate. Uh, all your presentations my brain. But yours uh, brought me back to 1970 when I had a uh, musical instrument company called Gentle Sounds. And I was also making things out of gourds. Oh, yeah. And I was selling them all over the world. All over the country. Uh, and I was making musical instruments. And, and I kept on thinking about gourds and gumbe and the, before and the Hawaiian uh, ipus that they make. Um, you know that hitting, and that's where I, I I would was thinking that maybe the box, the yeah, box might have had its earlier. Uh, have you explored that? Have you thought about it? I, I did find footage of different gourds also in in Peru. Um, I didn't. I had to but cut some out. into Africa. They used them as boats. Yeah. <laughs> aside from musical instruments. Yeah. yeah, the one that I saw is. Musical instrument in Peru, they it's a huge, they have a big, huge one like that, and they just cut a hole in it in the back, and then they play it like a cajon, really, with the lows in the middle, and then you get the higher like, timbers up up near the edges, and and then they have a smaller one too. I, um, in terms of origins, I'm I'm not sure where to go with this yet because it's a chicken and egg type situation. It feels like to me, I I don't know, I don't know if there was a African box drum that whose knowledge came across uh, mm -hmm. from Africa to the Americas and when they got there so let's let's make these again these are great drums or if they just wanted to get back to drumming and the best materials they had around were, were you know crates that, that they could right right so I'm, I'm not sure but but I was fascinated I've, I've seen those gourd used also that begins with a G. It does. I, I, this is true. <laughs> this is true. Uh, I'm going to keep looking at it. Yes. Thank you. So, Yorka, uh, we've been kind of like six degrees of separation for many, many years now. We have a mutual friend, Alice, who I feel like yes. we're all talking about the same things. Mm -hmm. Like, I had to call her up a couple of weeks ago crying because I'm in the middle of trying to finish my dissertation trying to fit myself into the academy mm -hmm. and I'm you know I'm in the dance studies mm -hmm. world of, mm -hmm. which is equally as 
problematic. And um, I just could relate so much to what you're talking about. As well, I don't perform anymore, but mm -hmm. back when I did, uh, my background is textbooks, mm -hmm. So, but every time I'm in the flamenco space, everybody's like, oh, what well, is this? I know you're Spanish, you're Spanish. You're like, no, I'm not. Like, uh -huh. That's and so it kind of. I, I feel you know, that you're erasing a certain part of your identity and having to conform. Like uh, my Mexican American grandmother made me have an H in my name. When my mother wanted to name me Teresa, she put the H in there because she thought it would make me sound more Anglo. <laughs> every time I'm on a flamenco show, they take out the H. I like, can put it in the all I want, they take it out. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I feel like that's a certain part of my my, mm -hmm. my story that's like maybe not doesn't not fit mm -hmm. with that narrative. Uh, so I guess basically my question is. Are you going to be like entering into more of these dance study spaces? Are you going to be going to more conferences so that like the DSA in Malta, I was the only one setting up flamenco in the entire conference. There's like hundreds of papers. I believe it. Um, yeah. It's very lonely. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, for me, you know, Teresa, it's a space that I kind of, um, I, this is the only way I can explain it. It's, it's like the difference between growing up in you know the waters of the Caribbean and going trying to put your foot in the beach in Spain um, you know it's it's such a drastic contrast that every time I go I sort of kind of creep in a little bit poke my head in and go okay man I'll say a few words and then I'll exit again mm -hmm. for me the problem is that I, I feel and this is what I what I'm trying to get across in this and in what I do is there has to be an embodiment there has to be. Yes. We can theorize all we want, back through history, uh, you know, through uh, performance studies paradigms. Through we can we can theorize all we want, but if there isn't a connection to what actually happens, and if we don't take into consideration the flexibility of human survival what happens, the flexibility and the spontaneity that's necessary when it's about survival. You gotta figure out how to fit in, you gotta figure out how to make this thing happen. You know, no, we don't have the extremes that we had two, three hundred years ago, but they're still there. You know, they're, the microaggressions there, all of it is there. And so, if we don't take that into consideration and we don't keep seeing how, to me it's the beauty of flamenco. It exists in both the tribal and the individual. It exists in the space between the two, you know? It's one informs the other. And if both of those things are not having the conversation hand in hand, it's to me it's a very scary place, and it's a, it's a place I choose not to step into because I usually get myself in trouble. So, um, but yeah, I think it is necessary. I think it's very necessary. I think it's very necessary, um, you know, to have to have spaces where both are given, you know, a place in the conversation. So yeah, this is so interesting to me as a kind of outsider. <laughs> or, you know, whoever side her. <laughs> um, so much of what you say is so familiar, of course, to any person of color. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you mentioned the thing about the uh, taking the H out of your name, the second book I wrote was on this ballroom team who uh, Margot, uh, you know, her, her name was M-A-R-G-O-T, but when she performed and they wanted the, her to be thought of as Spanish, she would take off the tea. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So just these little things like that, or this idea of you know hybridity and negotiation. You know, African Americans have been doing this all all the time. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. you know uh, how do you? Sp oh, oh, actually, you speak like a white person. I mean, just the whole thing around language alone. You know, not to mention embodiment and body movement and. Just this, it's so interesting though that you posit, you know, that it's it's how the other, the question, uh, Jay, that you asked me, Yorka, that it's how the other, uh, how you choose to see me, that you then reflect it back to me. I end one of my lectures though saying uh, um, a Buddhist thing, I keep going back to Buddhism, what the mind doesn't know, the eye cannot see. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That is, that is definitely yeah. central. And sometimes you don't even want to have to bother, you know, it's like, so they have the privilege, you know, and there I go with us and them, but they have the privilege, you know. So, okay, F you, you know, I'm, I, I don't have to. Uh, this uh, wonderful um, uh, 
the Afro-Caribbean uh, philosopher who has posited the idea of opacity. Yes, yes, and he says, um, I have, you know, I have the right to not be known by you. Yeah, I have the right of all Yes, I wanted to change another topic and, and uh, ask Isenia, because um, I'm not familiar, I'm not very familiar with the figure of the Burro, uh, but you made a comment uh, about the similarity between the Burro and the Marcos, uh -huh. uh, and um, I wanted to ask if there's a, um, a class pride on the the Curro, as those you can see in the, in the macros. I mean, there is this fascination from the uh, upper class and the elites uh, for the figure of the of the Curro. Uh, like, like in case that that they imitate the yes. the upper classes. No, no, I, no, if the upper classes imitate ah, the Curro. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, like trying to get some sure. of the cool. Yeah. Um, well, it's like the thing is like there is so such a little docu documentation about the curro mm -hmm. now that uh, I have to basically study a lot of Spanish 18th century uh, visual culture, the characters, and everything to to have like a better understanding about what the curro was in Havana, no? Mm -hmm. um, and um, and I and I and I think like like. For what I capture, they reproduce a, a lot of uh, the elements of, of the Majos in, 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 I don't know, urban centers in, in, in Havana. Uh, they were like the vigilantes of the neighborhoods, you know, the one that kind of, you know, created a, a, a map, you know, a geography, a different geography in the city, you know, and this is, this is my territory, this is your territory, mm -hmm. and if you have a business here, you have to pay me. So there were kind of this uh, mafia, you know, but at the same time, they were, they were sexy and they were visible and they walk with pride and they have the navaja too to cut anybody's face immediately. And not the way you're in you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's a perf it's like to be a to be a cura. Is it was a performance, you know? It was it was to be in action, you know. There was like it's like occurs to me like the curro never sleeps <laughs> like New York, no? Uh, so uh, so and and all those like are the descriptions of, of Majos and Mahism, um, you know, uh, movement in Spain. So um, so I have to, you know, in this archaeology, you know, again, you know, I have to kind of pull, you know, from different places because uh, besides that, I just will have like the chronicles that describe them. Yes, you know, yeah. in that in that way, you know. But I have to, I have to connect it to a broader Atlantic conversation, right. you know, about about gender and about embodiments and about spaces yes. and about identities. Um, but uh, I don't. I, I think. Um, I think the context of Cuba, uh, a, a historical process from the 19th century to the 20, was so particular, mm -hmm. uh, like becoming uh, like the like a slave society at the beginning of the uh, 19th century. That I don't think, like from any place, I see a lot of sympathy for blackness. Right. There's no sympathy for blackness. You know that's why I can. You know, working a little uh, in my in my dissertation about minstrel, I have to say, well, Eric Lot do not apply, you know, to the to the Cuban case. There is no sympathy for the black body. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so, and we have to wind it up. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, uh, so, so I think like like later on when um, like the minstrel the minstrel uh, theater become uh, such a, co a commercial trend, not only in Cuba, but in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about Cuban minstrel theater, and I'm talking about a minstrel from the US. Mm -hmm. uh, then you see kind of this play and carnivalization, you know, mm -hmm. uh, these ludic spaces, you know, in the upper classes can em embody, you know? But, but I think it was a moment in that there was enough distance, 
right? Uh, in between the performativity of blackness, it was so well established that they could play with it, mm -hmm. you know, but not in the case like the Bourbons, you know, uh, you know, dress as majos, etc. Okay. So. And this is obviously all to make <laughs> <Yes. Yes. laughs>